um, welcome everyone. Uh, I just see a message in the chat that the volume is low. Is everyone able to hear me okay? Or yeah? It's okay, okay. ma'am. Okay. Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, okay, Igwe, if you can just check the volume on your um, whatever you're using, if it's a laptop or a phone, and see if there's something you can adjust there. Okay, let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Is there anyone who would like to pray for us before we begin? Anyone in person? Let's pray. Thank you. Loving Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless you, we glorify your name, we give you thanks and worship this morning. We appreciate you for the gift of life and the wisdom and knowledge that you have given unto us, King of Glory. Lord, we want to surrender this time unto you, the teachings and all we are going to learn. We surrender unto your hands, we welcome the leadership of the Holy Spirit to help us and open our eyes and mind to know and to hear more from you. We bless you, glorify your name. In Jesus' name we are prayed. Amen. Thank you. Okay, so um, on Monday was when we had our first class. And we just looked a little bit at um, what we're going to be covering during this course. And uh, we also looked at um, some of the background to the beginning of the New Testament. So we looked at the political background and uh, we looked at the religious background, especially between Malachi and Matthew. So there's a 400 year period. Uh, and in that 400 year period, there were different groups of people that conquered uh, the region in which uh, the Israelites lived. So they uh, came and took over that region. And as they, um, as they were taking over that uh, region, they also influenced the religious practices of the people. Uh, right? So maybe we can just quickly uh, cover that. And then we will um, go into today's content. OK, so just for those of us who might have missed it. So we have the Persian reign from 400 to 334 BC, uh, the Alexandrian period. And this, uh, this one is important because uh, the Greek influence came in here. And um, we have uh, Greek becoming the language of the people. Uh, and Hebrew kind of being forgotten uh, by the Jews. Um, and then we have the Egyptian uh, period, which was uh, where Ptolemy, who was also of Greek origin, was reigning over uh, the Palestine region where the Israelites were, followed by the Seleucid Empire, which was still uh, someone from a Greek um, background who was reigning. And then uh, for a brief period of time, about 100 years, the Israelites uh, gain control over their land. Uh, this is the Maccabean period. Uh, so the Maccabees were reigning over uh, the Israelites, but they lose power to the Romans in 63 BC. And uh, so the Romans rule over Israel from 63 BC until uh, when Jesus uh, is born, the Romans are still in power. So when we see this AD 5, uh, it doesn't mean that the Roman reign ended here, but we're just saying 
till Jesus came, the Romans were still in power. And then they continued to reign even while Jesus was ministering, while Jesus was um, in Israel. So today we will look at um, the people groups uh, that the New Testament uh, consists of. So some of the major people groups that were present. And uh, we will look at some places of worship and then sacred writings. Um, all of these things will just contribute to our understanding of the New Testament. As we uh, look at the Gospels especially, uh, all of these things will contribute to that. So we have the Hebrews first. Um, this group of people uh, is introduced to us in Genesis 14 and 13, beginning with Abraham. So we will also uh, read a few scriptures. OK, so just uh, as we have these passages included here, we can open them and quickly read through them as well. Um, so if someone can read Genesis 14, 13 for us. Genesis 14, 13. Yes, Genesis 14, 13. Okay, sorry. And then then one who had escaped came and told Abraham, the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eschol and, and brother of Aner. And they were allies with Abraham. Now when... Okay, let's go. Thank you. So uh, here we see the term Hebrew, Abraham the Hebrew. Uh, so this is where the people were not known by, um, they were not known as Israelites, they were not known as Jews yet. They were just called a group of people, the Hebrew people, uh, starting with Abraham. And we see that also when Joseph is taken into Egypt, that he is identified as the Hebrew. Uh, so when Potiphar's wife accuses him uh, of acting inappropriately with her, she refers to him as the Hebrew slave. Um, so that is the identity of the people, the descendants of Abraham. So they're all called the Hebrews. And then um, when they continue to multiply under uh, the Egyptian rule, right? So we see in Exodus uh, when there is uh, the command that the Hebrew children, uh, the Hebrew sons especially, be put to death. Maybe we can just open Exodus 1.15 and read that. Exodus 1.15, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it's a boy, kill him, but if it's a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Thank you. Uh, so, and then if we go on into verse 19, um, yeah, the you can read. The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. Okay, so uh, until here, um, we do see even in this passage that they are referred to as the Israelites, but to outside groups of people, they just viewed them as the Hebrew people. Um, it's only after they enter the promised land that they gain uh, this identity as the Israelites. Um, and where do they get that name from? It's from Jacob being given the name Israel, right? So when God uh, changes his name to Israel, um, 
he then all of them identify as descendants of Jacob and so they are called the Israelites so that becomes a popular term for their identification after they enter the promised land uh, until then they're mostly known as the Hebrew people and then uh, where do we get this term Jews uh, so we see under David uh, that we had there was a kingdom that was united under David's rule. Um, this is in First Kings. Sorry, I haven't given you all the references here. Uh, but uh, in First Kings, we are introduced to uh, the king, uh, the role of a king within Israel, right? And we have Saul, who is the first king. And then David takes over. And when David takes over, he's ruling over the whole region uh, that the Israelites had come and taken over from Canaan. And he reigns over that whole region during his reign. After his reign, his son Solomon takes over. And Solomon continues to reign over the whole region. But what does Solomon do? He starts to uh, marry women of other, um, the foreign women that were around, and he starts to also worship their gods. He starts to build shrines for their gods, and so introduces pagan worship uh, into the land. And because of that, God's judgment is that um, he will take away 10 of the tribes, right, from the rule of David's line. 10 tribes will be taken away, and only two tribes will remain under David's line or David's uh, lineage, that they will rule over only two tribes. And those two tribes are Judah and Benjamin. OK? So, uh, so this is where Israel and Judah start to have that distinction. There's a different group of people, which are the 10 tribes who come under Israel, and the two tribes Judah and Benjamin come under the region of Judah. OK, um, so while Solomon is reigning, he's still reigning over the whole kingdom. But that judgment uh, that God passes is during this reign. And he says, until Solomon reigns, we will still, I'll still keep uh, the kingdom united because of my faithfulness to David. Uh, but after Solomon's reign, when his son takes over, who is Rehoboam, I will take the kingdom away from Rehoboam. Um, so let me see if I've given you all the reference here. I haven't. OK, we'll just try and read that because it's always better to read from the scriptures than here. Um, OK, so um, we'll open First Kings. And if someone can read uh, from verses 26. First Kings 11. Uh, to 40, 26 to 40. So we have a few verses to read. Also, Jeroboam, son of Nebat, rebelled against the king. He was one of Solomon's official, an Ephraimite from Zerida, and his mother was a widow named Zeruah. Here in the account of how he rebelled against the king, Solomon had built the supporting terraces and had filled in the gap of the wall of the city of David, his father. Now Jeroboam was a man of standing, and when Solomon saw how well the young man did his work, he put him in charge of the whole labor force of the house of Je Joseph. About that time, Jeroboam was going out of Jerusalem, and Ahijah, the prophet of Shiloh, met him on the way wearing a new cloak. 
The two of them were alone out in the country, and Ahija took hold of the new cloak he was wearing and tore it into 12 pieces. Then he said to Jeroboam, take 10 pieces for yourself, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. See, I'm going to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hand and give you 10 tribes. But for the sake of my servant David and the city of Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, he will have one tribe. I will do this because they have forsaken me and worshipped Astoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Molek, the god of Ammonites, and have, walk, have not walked in my ways, nor done what is right in my eyes, nor kept my statutes and laws as David, Solomon's father, did. But I will not take the whole kingdom out of Solomon's hand. I have made him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of David, my servant, whom I chose and who observed my commands and statutes. I will take the kingdom from his son's hands and give you 10 tribes. I'll give one tribe to his son so that David, my servant, may always have a lamb before me in Jerusalem the city where I chose to put my name. However, as for you, I will take you and you will rule over all that your heart desires. You will be king over Israel. If you do whatever I command you and walk in my ways and do what is right in my eyes by keeping my statutes and commands, as David my servant did, I will be with you. I will build you a dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David. I will give Israel to you. I will humble David's descendants because of this, but not forever. Solomon tried to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam fled to Egypt to Shishak, the king, and stayed there until Solomon's death. Okay, so here, this is, uh, we just re uh, read what I had uh, mentioned before where God's judgment comes upon Solomon and he says that he's going to take away these 10 tribes uh, from under Solomon uh, or David's lineage and uh, give it away to Jeroboam. Uh, so once Solomon dies, his son Rehoboam comes into power and Jeroboam then comes to him along with a few other people of Israel and they uh, they come to him and ask him whether he will reduce the burden that was upon his people, right? Upon their people. Um, so let's just read that part as well. Um, 1 Kings 12, verse 2. Um, what is that about? Yeah, verse 2 to 5. When Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard this, he was still in Egypt, where he had fled from King Solomon. He returned from Egypt. So they sent for Jeroboam, and he and the whole assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam and said to him, Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us and we will serve you. The Hebam answered, Go away for three days and then come back to me. So the people went away. Thank you. And then can you continue from verse 12 uh, till verse 17? Three days later, Zerubbam and all the people returned to Rehoboam as the king had said, Come back to me in three days. The king answered the people harshly, rejecting the advice given him by the elders. He followed the advice of the king man, of the any man, and said, My father made your yoke heavy. I will make it even heavier. My father scorched you with whites. I will scorch you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for this turn of events was from the Lord, to fulfill the word of the Lord had spoken to Zeroboam, son of Naboth, through Ahiza, the Shilonite. When all Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king, What share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son to your tents, Israel? 
Look after your own house, David. So the Israelites went home. But as for the Israelites who were living in the towns of Judah, the Hebron still ruled over them. Thank you. So uh, we see that David's um, descendants continue to rule over Judah, and uh, over time, the Jew, uh, the people who live in Judah, become called the Jews. Okay, so uh, that's how we see that term change. So from uh, Hebrew to Israelites to Jews. Okay, so uh, when this division happens, uh, Israel becomes a different nation and Judah becomes a different nation. And in Israel, we have the capital, which is Samaria. And that nation exists until the Assyrians come in and capture the land. Uh, so the Assyrians came in in 722 BC uh, and they capture the land and uh, take the Israelites into exile. We'll read a little bit more about this as we're looking uh, at who the Samaritans are. Uh, for now, we'll just end with that. So the nation of Israel kind of ends there uh, with the Assyrians coming in in 722 BC and capturing the people and taking them into exile. Uh, so Judah continues for a little longer uh, with the capital in Jerusalem uh, until the Babylonians come in. So they come in a little later in 605 BC, taking the people captive and taking them into exile. These people who remain in Judah start to be called the Jews. It's only after the return. So we talked about the Persian conquest, right? So the Persians uh, capture uh, this whole region, the Palestine region, after the Babylonians. And then King Cyrus sends people back to Jerusalem to reestablish, to rebuild the temple and uh, rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. It is at this time that the terms Jew, Israelites, Hebrews all start to be become the same thing. Okay, so it's only the Judeans who start to be called Israelites after that, because the people of Israel have already been gone into exile. And when they come back, they start to be called the Samaritans. Uh, so they are a different group of people. But the Judeans who are the descendants of the tribe of Judah, uh, continue to be called Israelites or Jews or Hebrews. Okay, uh, is that clear? Yes. Okay. Um, any questions so far? You good. Okay. Let's uh, just look at this passage in Second Kings. 17.6 and then 24 to 35. In the ninth year of Ossia, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria. He settled them in Halak, in Gozan, on the Habar River, and in the towns of the Medes. And Pastor? Uh, verses 24 to 35. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutuha, Awa, Hamat, and Sepharavayam, and settled them in the towns of Samaria to replace the Israelites. They took over Samaria and lived in, ta in its towns. When they first lived there, they did not worship the Lord. So he sent lions around them, and they killed some of the people. It was reported to the king of Assyria, the people you departed and resettled in the towns of Samaria don't know what the god of that country requires. He has sent lions among them, which are killing them off, because the people do not know what he requires. Then the king of Assyria gave this order, have one of the priests you took captive from Samaria go back to live there and teach the people what the God of the land requires. 
So one of the priests who had been exiled from Samaria came to live in Bethel and taught them how to worship the Lord. Nevertheless, each national group made its own gods in the several towns where they settled and set them up in the shrines the people of Samaria had made at the high places. The people from Babylon made Sukkot, Benot, those from Tuha made Nergal, and those from Hamar made Ashima. Is it okay, Pastor? Uh, till 35. Oh. The Abetis made Ibas and Tatak, and the Separabetis burned their children in the fire as sacrifices to Adramel and Anamalek, the gods of Separavium, they worshipped the Lord, but they also appointed all sorts of their own people to officiate for them as priests in the shrines at the high places. They worshipped the Lord, but they also served their own gods in accordance with the customs of the nations from which they had been brought. To this day, they praise, they praise persist in their former practices. They neither worship the Lord nor adhere to the decrees and regulations, the laws and commands that the Lord gave the descendants of Jacob, whom he named Israel. When the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites, he commanded them, do not worship any other gods or bow down to them, serve them or sacrifice to them. Okay, so we see how um, that group of people changes completely, right? What we read in this passage, the, Samarit uh, the Israelites, those 10 tribes are exiled. And what uh, the Assyrians do is they send all different people from different nations to go and start living in that region. Uh, and those people then don't know how to worship uh, worship Yahweh. So there's a priest who's sent in to teach them how to worship Yahweh. But along with that worship, they also start to worship their gods from their nations. Uh, and so this group of Samaritans is considered as people uh, from a mixed religion and people from a mixed blood because some of them also married Israelites and had children with them. And so uh, they don't consider them as true descendants of Israel. The Jews don't consider the Samaritans as true descendants of Israel or worshippers of the true God. That is their view of the Samaritans. So when the Jews returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, um, the Samaritans come in offering to help them rebuild the temple. And the Jews refuse to let them be part of that because they view them as foreigners. They don't view them as true Israelites. Uh, and this, uh, this relationship between the Samaritans and Jews just starts to continue uh, to become uh, one that is um, that, that fosters hatred uh, because each of them views the other as uh, people who are not following the true God, uh, who are not following, uh, who are not worshiping the true God. Uh, and we see that continue into the New Testament as well. Uh, now, um, to also, okay, I think we will cover this a little later, so I won't go into that for now, but the temple and the place of worship we'll uh, look at a little later. Um, so the next group of people we're going to look at is the scribes. They are also called the teachers of the law or lawyers or rabbis in the New Testament. Um, can someone open Ezra 7, verse 6 and 10, if you can read that for us? Ezra 7, verse 6. Okay. Um, this Ezra came up from Babylon, and he was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given him. The king granted him all his request according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. Uh, and 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, to do it, and to teach statutes and 
ordinances in Israel. Okay, thank you. So um, this is where we see the scribes uh, developing as a group of people. Ezra's uh, one of the first scribes that we see talked about in the Bible. Um, so when the is uh, when the Jews were taken into captivity by the Babylonians, they didn't have their temple to worship in, and so teaching the law grew in importance, right? That was the way for them to maintain um, their identity as, as Jews. The only way was to pass on what had been taught in the law of Moses by their prophets. Uh, so all of that is what began to be emphasized because there was no temple worship that they were practicing in exile. Um, and this is when the scribes start to become more important because they are the ones who preserve uh, that law and who pass it on to the people. Uh, so one of the ways they did that was they made copies of the Jewish scriptures. And this was uh, something that was highly revered. Their work was highly revered because uh, it required a lot of skill. Um, it required a lot of attention to detail because they had to make sure they were not making any errors as they were making copies of the scripture. There was no printing press. Uh, there was no easy way to make copies of the scripture. They were actually writing it down. Someone would recite and uh, the scribes would sit down and write what was being recited. Uh, so it required a lot of skill, knowledge of the law, and um, they were people who were trained in the law to continue to make these copies so that people would learn the scriptures. The other thing they did was to teach the people, especially to teach children the scriptures. Um, and then once synagogues were established, so synagogues were established when they went back to Jerusalem and they rebuilt the temple uh, and people settled in other parts of, uh, of the Palestine region synagogues were established as local places of teaching the law. And so scribes would be um, in these synagogues teaching the people the Torah. And then um, what happens over time is that the scribes also added to the law. So if someone can read Matthew 15, 1 to 9, and 23, 2 to 4, uh, we see in uh, the New Testament, Jesus addressing the scribes and the teachers of the law, um, usually not in positive ways, and we'll see why. Can I read, sister? Uh, sure, go ahead. Thank you. Matthew 15, uh, 1 to 9. Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. He answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God? Because of your tradition. For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother. And he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit, father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. Then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. Thank you. Want me to read 23 to 4? Yes, please. Uh, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works. For they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move 
uh, them with one of their fingers. Thank you. So uh, we see here that they had started to interpret the law because the scribes were interpreting the law and teaching the law to people. So while they were interpreting the law, they were also adding additional rules, uh, making additional, or they were making it, uh, applying it to people in a way that was contrary to uh, God's intent for the people or God's heart for the people. Uh, and so there were additional laws being added, additional rules being added for the people uh, by the time Jesus had uh, Jesus had come and Jesus had started to minister. So what had begun as something that was a really good thing that they had started to uh, ensure that people were educated in the teachings of the scriptures. Uh, over time became a place of power and abuse over the people of Israel. OK, so uh, next we look at uh, the Sanhedrin. OK, so um, where do we see the Sanhedrin in the New Testament? And in the judgment of Jesus? Yes, so the Sanhedrin plays, uh, that's where I think we see uh, the Sanhedrin's role really uh, come in, is when Jesus is brought to trial before the leaders, the Jewish leaders, and uh, they decide that he should be put to death, and then they take him to the Roman authorities. Um, so who were the Sanhedrin? Uh, they were uh, people who actually were given power by the Romans uh, and they were basically the elders, the Jewish elders, uh, scribes, priests and other uh, people who were respected among the Jewish people. Okay, so they were people with a lot of power. It consisted of 70 members apart from the high priest. So with the high priest, it was 71. And the high priest was the one who uh, was the main, who was the main leader of the Sanhedrin. Uh, so uh, these elders were first established during the time of Ezra. And uh, the synagogues each had a committee so over time, that committee became something that was also being practiced in Jerusalem. Uh, the Sanhedrin was a group of people that ruled in Jerusalem. And uh, the Sanhedrin had power to arrest people, to make judgments uh, in case of religious matters especially. They could punish people and they could even uh, pronounce uh, that uh, the person should be put to death but they couldn't carry out that punishment. Okay, so it was only the Romans who could put people to death, but the Sanhedrin could decide if someone should be given a death sentence. Um, the main reason they could uh, give for someone being put to death was if someone had defiled the temple. So that was the only reason where they themselves could carry out this capital punishment uh, for someone. So uh, we see in John 18, 31, uh, when, when they go to the Roman authorities, we'll just open that, John 18, 31. OK, so they've taken Jesus before uh, Pilate. And Pilate says, um, he says, take them, uh, take Jesus away and judge him by your own law. Uh, and so they reply to Pilate, only the Romans are permitted to execute someone. So while they could, uh, they could give that sentence, they couldn't actually put Jesus to death, which is why they take him uh, to the Roman authorities to carry out their sentence. Um, what is um, interesting and sad at the same time is that in Jesus's trial, so the Sanhedrin, the main goal of that group was to make sure that the Jews were upholding the laws, the Jewish laws. Okay, so they were uh, in charge of, um, they were kind of a committee or a, a justice system for the Jews. 
okay so they were the judges for the jews in terms of religious and some civil matters uh, but in jesus's trial they themselves break a lot of their own laws uh, one is they conduct the trial at night which is not allowed uh, second is that it's a secret meeting they haven't actually because they do it they arrest jesus in secret they haven't actually invited the whole sanhedrin to be there for Jesus' trial. So uh, they break their own laws in that. Um, they also, there is contradictory testimony from the witnesses for Jesus' trial, which right away they should have dismissed the case and punished false witnesses, but they don't do any of that. So in Jesus' case, uh, we see the corruption within the Sanhedrin where they rule, they're supposed to uphold the Jewish law, but they use it uh, in whatever way they, it pleases them to accomplish their own purposes. Uh, so we see um, that a lot of corruption had come into uh, the leaders, the Jewish leaders who were in the Sanhedrin. OK, so next we look at the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Um, the Sadducees are not mentioned a lot in the New Testament, right? Can you all remember where the Sadducees are mentioned or anything in the New Testament that we know about the Sadducees? Sister, Sadducees are sad to see. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's from a song I think we learned when we were younger. So what is uh, it that the New Testament talks about the Sadducees? OK. So they're one of the groups of people who oppose uh, Jesus in his ministry. Um, yes, that's definitely true. And we'll also look at why they, uh, they are in opposition to Jesus's ministry. Um, so we also uh, know that one of the big things was that they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. And Jesus says, uh, you don't believe it because you don't know the scriptures. Right, he says to the Sadducees. So uh, these were two groups of people, Sadducees and Pharisees, who developed the Pharisees especially came into existence when the when the Jews returned to Jerusalem under the Persian rule. Okay, so the Pharisees uh, comprised of many scribes. So this, as the synagogues were being built and the scribes were coming uh, to a place of importance as religious leaders, this group of Pharisees also started to grow and they were mostly comprised of the scribes. Um, we don't know exactly when the Sadducees uh, were formed, this group of people was formed, um, but Sometime in opposition to this pharisaical uh, group of people, the Sadducees came in. So the main differences between these groups, so the Sadducees were pro-political. Uh, so during the Maccabean rule, the Maccabees restored temple worship, which was an amazing thing for the Jews, but they also took over politically. And this was not something that was... Um, that was supported by the scribes. The scribes were very interested in maintaining uh, the religious purity of the Jews, but they were not interested in political power, and they were not interested in politicians having power over the religious practices of the Jews. They wanted to, uh, that to be separate from politics. The Sadducees, however, were very interested in political power. So they were Jews who, uh, enjoyed political power. So like the Maccabees, who had come into a place of power and wanted to reign over the Jews, the Sadducees sided with them. So they had a lot of favor from those in power, the politicians in power, whereas the Pharisees were seen as people in opposition to politicians. Um, the Sadducees also comprised mainly of priests, 
uh, especially the high priests and other leaders in society. They were usually wealthy. They usually had a lot of power and influence, uh, mainly among the higher classes. The Pharisees, on the other hand, mainly comprised of scribes, but also there were priests. So there were also Pharisees in the Sanhedrin um, and Sadducees in the Sanhedrin. Both of them were in the Sanhedrin. Um, but the Pharisees were usually poorer people. They were from lower classes of society, and they didn't have a lot of power because they were not very interested in the politics side of it. Um, but both groups of people had power because the Sadducees had the support of the politicians, but the Pharisees had the support of the people, right? Uh, so the Sadducees were actually afraid of the Pharisees because the Pharisees could influence uh, the common people and they could get uh, the people to support whatever they wanted. Um, in terms of beliefs, the Sadducees believed only in the written scriptures. They didn't believe in any oral traditions that were passed down, whereas the Pharisees believed in oral tradition as well. So when Jesus is saying, you add, you've you added so much to the law, it's because the Pharisees believed in that oral tradition. So if someone was teaching the scriptures, they would also add their interpretation of the scriptures. And that would be given a lot of importance by the Pharisees. On the other hand, the Sadducees would only take what was written in the law as binding for people. So they felt that you can interpret it the way you want to interpret it. Uh, only if it's written in the law, you need to follow it. How you interpret it is up to you. The Pharisees, on the other hand, felt that how the scribes interpret it is what the people must follow. They have to follow it the way the scribes are interpreting it. Uh, and then a few other beliefs is the Sadducees believed in human freedom. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead or in the eternal uh, life that the soul has. And they didn't believe in angels. Uh, Pharisees, on the other hand, believed in all these things. So we see a lot of um, just between these two groups of people, they had power but uh, they also had a lot of disputes between them. OK. Um, I think this is the last two groups of people that we look at, are the publicans and the zealots. I think we're also out of time, aren't we? It's in the end of class. OK, so um, we will come back on Monday, and we look at these last two groups of people and then uh, go into uh, the rest of the introduction before we actually look at the book of Matthew. OK, thank you. Thank you, sister. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.